morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Burke this morning. He doesn't need much of an introduction. He did his med school here at ECU and then did his training, um, dermatology training at UNC. He's now currently the uh, residency program director for dermatology. So, um, Thanks a lot, Deb. Today we're going to talk about occupational uh, skin disorders, and uh, I have no conflicts of interest to uh, disclose. Skin disease is the most common non-trauma-related occupational illness, so it is something that almost everybody will see, no matter what you're going to. Uh, most of the time, 80% of the time, it's going to be um, a contact dermatitis, and it can be irritant or allergic, and it's almost always on the hands, and it's almost always irritant rather than allergic, so it kind of makes it easy. Some questions to a answer when you see somebody who comes in and says, I've got this problem and it's my work doing. Um, is this a skin problem really related to work or is it something else? Um, is it acute or chronic problem? Is it treatable? And if it's treatable, is it preventable to, to keep coming on? And if it's not preventable, is it disabled? Uh, the occupational skin disorders I came up with, again, dermatitis is going to be the most common thing that's usually here to hand dermatitis. Uh, I've got allergic there, and we'll talk a little bit about patch testing. Uh, atopic uh, individuals are people with sensitive skin, basically, and they're, they're the ones that get a lot of the irritant dermatitis. Uh, ultraviolet light can cause skin tumors, uh, photo reactions like phototoxic, photoallergic eruptions, and then photo diseases like porphyria, contagious tartar, lupus, and things like that. Traumatic injuries are a big cause of occupational, uh, we don't see as many of them, but burning lacerations, other injuries. Heat can give you heat rash, uh, thermal burns, uh, other things. Moisture can give you uh, intermittent wet dry cycles, can lead to eczema, perinicida, which is a nail cold uh, infection, intertrigo, which is a frictional dermatitis. Cold can lead to frostbite, uh, colder area, uh, and xerosis or dry skin. Um, infections or infestations can come on some jobs, uh, bites and snakes along the same line. In fact, tissue, let me emphasize that, if you don't keep that on your differential when you see somebody comes in with a work-related um, something, you're going to miss it. That's a real important. We do allergenic testing, and we use the True Test, which is a, uh, a test that you can buy, and the kit costs about uh, $85 or so. Um, we do a testing, it's 29 of the most common things people react to. And when we do it, we don't know what we're looking for. It's kind of a fishing expedition. Uh, then you, once you find they're allergic to it, is it related to what you're seeing? Uh, you can also do testing of things by mixing them down, uh, uh, diluting them down, I should say, and testing if we use fit chambers. We'll see examples of that. Those are made by uh, different companies. Allergies is one of them. Uh, and you can buy, actually, other kits, but I think the true test the reason we use it is it's the simplest one to use. And then there's some reference books as well. So we're just going to go through some cases. This gentleman came in and said he uh, was a farm worker. He'd been working on the farm since he was uh, 14 years old, and now he's elderly, and he has a rash head to toe. Uh, he said it started years ago just on the hands, and then it spread kind of his arms, and now he's got it again all over. Um, we had to clear him up and we did some testing on him. And we used a kit since he's a farm worker and we have composite allergy is a common thing in farm workers, or at least it used to be. Um, and we found he was allergic to ragweed. Now, ragweed is why I'm forced right now. And ragweed pollen has a water soluble antigen, which uh, is uh, what gives the hay fever. But it's the organic solvent soluble sesquiterpene lactone. Uh, antigen that's actually in the leaves and the rest of the plant that is what gives you the contact on the plants. And it's in the compositing group. This is right in here, and you can see it's a uh, very small uh, flowerette here that doesn't show up very much. It's one of the most common things you see in uh, kind of uh, waste areas along roadsides. If you look at the lot on the other side of the moy too, it's going to look right in the of these little flowerettes here. This is tick seed marigold, and it's also in the compositing. And the reason we don't see this as much anymore is that back in the old days, of course, people used to weed by hand, and they would get sensitized to these plants, and it was very common. Nowadays, when uh, uh, farmers weed, they use herbicides, and they're up in their uh, cab, their air conditioning, or the heated um, tractor cab, 
and um, they just don't get exposed like they used to. And so we don't see this as much as we used to. It's usually an elderly person that happens. And um, this is a airborne contact dermatitis is what it eventually becomes uh, to composite. It used to be a very, very common thing, and now it's pretty rare. Um, there's over 25,000 species in the composite tea. Very gold seniors that you have in your garden in that group. Uh, most of the weeds that we have around are kind of, And again, such so terpene lactones will give you the allergy. It's a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction, and it can be totally disabled when you get it like this gentleman had. Now, this was a fisherman who came in, and the sore that's on his fingertip here. Uh, was actually a, a little cut, and he worked in the bilge of his boat, and that got kind of festered up, he said, and it, did, it started spreading, and he ended up moving right up his arm, and kind of a spore of trich trichosis like that. Uh, the most common thing we see that gives you spore of trichosis like that, or a spore of trichoidemia, is Mycobacterium marinum. Of course, he's a commercial fisherman, so that's what we thought this was, and indeed, that's what it grew out. Um, we treat him, um, back in those days, we usually used metacycline and these fluorectomized for now. Um, and this was uh, just a few weeks later, we have already cleared up. We usually treat for several months, and again, this is a acute problem. Uh, it actually comes on pretty gradually over, over usually at several months, <coughs> but the patient uh, can go right back to work, obviously. This is another one that was uh, when he was uh, sorting his bycatch. Uh, got spined by a fish spine and got injuries in that. And this is a crab fisherman who got pinched by a crab, and this is uh, Mycobacterium marinum. Now it's a photochromogen, it's in running group one, and when you grow it here on Zill Mills in, in the dark, it produces no pigment, but when you grow it in the presence of light, it produces a carotenoid pigment and it's yellow, so photochromogen. One of the keys to growing it is that you need to warn the lab that you're thinking about this because they have to grow it at 30 to 32 degrees so it won't grow. It does not grow well at body temperature. And as a result, you're not only can use the antibiotics I've listed down here, usually in kids we use separate, um, but you can also uh, use heat, hot water soaks or meat and fat. And fishermen, seafood processors, people with home aquaria are the people who are at risk for this. Now this is a farmer who comes in and he says, I've got this rash on my foot. And what he was talking about was this here. But when you examine the foot, you can see it's got kind of scaly redness and kind of a border here. If you look between the toes, there'd be maceration, toenail dystrophy. Uh, this is a moccasin-style tinny pepis. It's always positive. But this is the one we're focusing on here, the one that brought him in. And, uh, that was kind of new to him. If you look, there's little pits of that, so this is mostly uh, stratum corneum. And this is called pitted keratolysis, and it comes from uh, feet that are in boots and sweat all day long. And the tinea pit is along the same lines. So uh, this is actually a pitting the stratum corneum that's due to several organisms. It can be chlorine bacteria, it can be dermatophilus condolensis, or peditacus and inferiors. And we use just plain old erythromycin topically to, to treat it. We need to be careful to do that. Um, and if you treat the hyperhidrosis, if it's really bad sweating, that, that helps you prevent it. Here's just another example of getting erythromycin by itself. Now, this is a dairy farmer who comes in. He's got this on his finger. And it's a nodular lesion. It's fairly solid here, but it's got the vesicle pustule at the edge here. And this is a very typical presentation for one of two things. It's either a milker's nodule or wart. And milker's nodule is what a dairy farmer like this guy would have. Important to recognize because it's something that doesn't need treatment. Uh, it's due to pox or parapox virus. And you know, again, if it's a, somebody exposed to uh, dairy or uh, callus, it's milker's nodule. And again, no treatment is necessary. Um, and if it's a goat or sheep worker, uh, it's or. And this is a picture of or of lesions of a particular individual. And again, no treatment necessary. This guy uh, was worked for the city of Greenville, and his job, he's a refuge uh, collector. He would be the one that was on the truck that would come around and gather up all the plant material that people would put at the side of the road. Uh, real busy after this hurricane just happened. 
Um, but he came in with a very itchy rash all over his arms. And um, I always teach the students, if you have linear vesicles that itch, it's what is it? What is not good? No. So that's what this is, and again, this is something you can go back to work for once you treat. Um, poison ivy is a three leaf and sleeve of bee, and um, it actually, the sap, oxid, when it's oxidized, here's where a bug is going to bite in this leaf. It gives you the black spot sign. It's the urushiol, um, is the allergen uh, that's in it, and it ox when oxidized, it turns black. You can actually see that also when you um, cut the the uh, vine, you can actually see the black around the right inside the bark of the plant. And in the wintertime, that can help you identify it very carefully. Now, here you look at it and say, which one's the poison ivy? There's two vines growing up the tree. This one immediately you think is poison ivy, but if you look more carefully, it's got four or five leaves on some of these. And this is Virginia creeper. You look over here, and this is uh, poison ivy. Now the shape of the poison ivy leaf will, will change. This is growing in a maple forest, and so the leaf kind of looks like a maple leaf. When it grows in the beech forest, it's got real smooth leaf, more like this plant on the right. And this is the leaves are real shiny in the early spring and early summer. Now it's not a problem as much around here, we'll talk about it in a minute, but on the west coast it's really disabled. In fact, it's one of the most disabled skin diseases that you see. And it's in the, because of all the fires that are out there, the wildfires, um, the, the, the workers, the firefighters actually get sensitized and they get disabled from it. Um, and it's due to the Western Poison Oak. This is taken on the coastal range near Monterey, California. And it's one of the most common plants on the West Coast. Just like poison ivy is one of the most common plants around here. Now, we have eastern poison oak. In fact, a lot of times patients come in and say, Doc, I got poison oak. Probably not poison oak, it's probably poison ivy. Po poison oak is around here, but it's pretty rare. This is eastern poison oak. We also note it, note it as woodcutter's dermatitis. Now, woodcutter's dermatitis, if you read in the textbooks, they talk about liver warts and lichens, and that's mainly on the west coast where they do a lot of forestry. Um, in our area here, it's almost always poison ivy. And uh, that's because if you look at this tree here, you know, if you're going to chainsaw this tree, this big vine right here is a poison ivy vine, and all these little ones are too. And so as you go through that, of course, that gets into the dust, and uh, you end up getting that case of poison ivy. Uh, or if you chainsaw this, this is poison sumac, and you can see here it's got that black spot on it. Right? bug has been chewing on them, not to, to be confused with the white spot sun here from a bird. Um, but poison sumac, if you try chainsawing that, it's going to give you woodcutters dermatitis from poison on the base of poison sumac in this case. You can use a protective uh, lotion, your ivy block is one brand, and these do work, but they're kind of messy to use, and you end up having to bathe in this, this stuff pretty much. Uh, it's in the Anacardiaceae family, and the cashew nut, the thing that holds the nut on the tree, is what it actually has the ruchy on it. The Indian marking nut tree is, uh, it used to be that they used to mark the laundry. In fact, the neck is one of the most common places to break out if you're allergic. Uh, Japanese lacquer tree, and you can take old vases from 10 centuries ago and get the lacquer off that, and it still would cause a reaction. Um, poison wood in the Everglades of Florida, uh, Florida holly, or Brazilian pepper, one of the most common plants on the roadside is down there. There's another one. And mango, if you're allergic to poison ivy and you peel a mango using your mouth, you'll get it all over your face because it's right inside the peel. That's where the sap is. And Yerushio, the name of the sap, is actually from the Japanese word for, for sap. Eighty percent of all people can be sensitized to this. Um, mucous membranes are involved. I get calls all the time from primary care doctors. They say, I've got this patient, I've got poison ivy all over your face, and I'm worried it's going to get in the eyes. And it won't. Uh, you get all around it, but it doesn't get in it. In fact, you can chew poison ivy leaves and swallow them, and it doesn't break out until it comes out your other end. And the other thing I want to emphasize is when you treat poison ivy, you go for three weeks because typically it's going to get worse for a week, level off for a week, and you start to get better for a week. So if you treat
treat people for three weeks. Don't use the little dose packs that they don't work. Now this was a commercial fisherman. He came in and this is, he, he said every time when he rubs his knees up against the gunnel of his boat, he lifts her up. And it's been going on for about a year. And he also, when he pulls in the nets on the boat, his hands blister. So this is a mechanobolus kind of disorder. And one of the diseases that can cause that is a, uh, a disease that's called epidermolus bolus or quizza. It's an autoimmune disease. And it looks very similar to Bolt's Kemper wood on biopsy under the microscope. Um, but it's it's a tough one to treat. This time that could not get better. So this is a chronic condition that we could not really improve even with immunosuppressive therapy, heavy duty immunosuppressive therapy. And I, I, I said, um, so, you know, I'm going to support you for disability. He said, Doctor, I don't want disability since I got to work. He said, I'm going back to work. Very stoic individual from the outer banks. And I, I bet he's still working with us today. EBA is what we abbreviated as. And uh, I even sent him to Chapel Hill to a blistering expert on this disease up there. And put him in the so that's nothing that's totally related to the occupation except for the mechanical part of it. And yet, that's a disabling condition. This is a person that works on the line up at uh, the Purdue Industries chicken industry, and, uh, part of the deep feathering of the chicken. He wears gloves, but he can't sweat in the gloves all the time. He's got an inflammation of the proximal nail fold. And if you look closely, the nails that still have the cuticle aren't very much bothered, but they have the box opening this little pocket of the proximal nail fold where water gets up in there and then you end up with chronic, uh, usually yeast infection. And this is chronic perinicchia is what we term this. Um, what we use in general, I use a brand name here, Michelob 2, contains nystatin and trying cinnamon, and you actually apply that to the nails uh, twice a day. Um, and try to keep the hands as dry as possible. It's exposure to water in wet dry cycles and actually leaves the cuticle. This is very common. In fact, some of you in the room probably have had this get your hands in water too much. Again, it's the wet dry cycle, so dishwashers, waitresses, bartenders are at high risk for it, and people that uh, work up at Purdue or Purdue um, Avoidance of the wet dry water uh, exposure is an important thing. And that's with the chronic um, one, with the acute um, perinicky, which we'll see in a minute, there's usually pus present, and you have to drain that. And it's usually staph or pseudomonas that's in there. And this is an acute perinicky. You can see pus right here. And what you do there is lay a number 11 blade down right on the nail, pushing in to the proximal nail fluid and drain it. We usually do a gram stain to see which organism it is, and then we treat it and buy a sipper for, for uh, pseudomonas and um, whatever your favorite receptor for staph. Now this is a commercial fisherman who had bumped himself on the air conditioner of his boat on the shin and the next day it was, it was already big red air and he was starting to get fever. This is two days after he did it and any uh, cellulite that goes that quickly blistering in the right wrist factor, uh, which is commercial fishing here, uh, is vibrio vomificus. And this is a very, very serious infection. Uh, patients usually present with septic shock and that's what this fact presents as. Um, and even with treatment, when they present with septic shock, it's a quarter of a 70% mortality. And the treatment uh, from this guy was IV, um, doxycycline, cetirizine. And uh, um, he did actually did well he, he went through this. Um, but it's a very, very serious infection. You can culture the organism from the blister and, of course, from the bloodstream itself. And uh, this is the other side of his leg. And again, growth of the organism is how you define it. But start the antibiotics right off the bat. It's a brain negative curved rod uh, related to cholera. And uh, the word has gotten out on this, and I think most um, fishermen are familiar with it. Most of our coastal docks, I think, are familiar with it. And this is a secondary vibrio vulnerable septicemia. It comes from a wound infection that then becomes bloodborne. Uh, the primary is when you eat, ingest the organism, that's usually raw and undercooked shellfish, usually oysters. That's where you get that. Um, again, 40 to 70% mortality, even with uh, uh, 
treatment. And the treatment again, doxycycline, if you see a real early infection, maybe on the first day, and uh, septanzidine along with that. Um, if it's um, uh, intravenously, if it's a uh, um, band infection with sepsis. Now the risk factors for becoming uh, septic is, is liver disease is the primary one that we see, but also immunosuppressed patients for those with liver, liver diseases. So real healthy people aren't the ones that you usually see with the bad infections. The guy that I showed had cirrhosis and didn't know it. This lady works in a cafeteria and has been disabled from work for five years. And uh, she brings in her disability papers for you to sign. And you look at her and you look at her record and um, she's had a porphyria, 24 hour event for porphyria, and that was negative. She's had biopsies of this which show acute and chronic inflammation and scarring. Um, and she said, uh, you know, they, they won't let her work when her hands were like this. Now there's a big clue here of what we're dealing with. It's this linear pattern right here. And if you see linearity like that, and it's not a disease that when you scratch comes up along the scratch called kebnerization, um, then it means it's externally induced. And even kebnerization is externally induced from the scratch. Um, but this is factitial. This lady's doing this to herself. And probably using a cigarette to burn herself is probably what I suspect. But what you do is, first of all, think of it, you know, if, you're, if you don't have that on your differential, anytime you see somebody comes in and says it's related to work or they're on disability, always think about this, because if you don't, you're going to miss it, and it's not that uncommon. So always think about that, it's number one. Number two, confront the patient. If you suspect it, look at them in the eye and say, I think you're doing this to yourself. And you're going to get three mutual reactions. You'll get them just break down and cry and confess to them. And that's easy. You can deal with that. You'll get them look at you and say, Oh, damn, you stupid damn doctor. I knew damn well I should have gone to the Dukes. Um, and they storm out of your office and they never see it. And that's okay, too. Uh, that's probably the best. <laughs> um, or, or they look you right in the eye and they say, No, I'm not doing this. And, uh, and there you got a problem. The way I deal with that is I just keep bringing them back for more appointments and I keep them from you. And uh, eventually they either go somewhere else or they, they eventually uh, uh, come around to working with you. A lot of times you can get them back to work that way. Now this is a, a common problem that we see. This is a guy actually who hooked up cows to milking machines and his job was to scrub the cow udders with beta dye first and put the milking machine up. And he's got a, a hand dermatitis. You notice it doesn't involve the palms very much. It's meant to be back of the hand with skin is thinner. So I suspect, suspected an error in contact dermatitis here. We did patch testing the beta dye, and it was negative. So this is an irritant contact dermatitis from the beta dye. And I said, Do you wear gloves when you hook this stuff up? And he said, Oh, yeah. And I said, uh, How old are the gloves? He said, We got them about 10 years ago. Well, I think that any time we get down in the gloves and we food it, and uh, we treat them with topical steroid and got them some new gloves and we did fine. But it, it's a fairly sharp cutoff here on this guy, and if you begin to look at the palms, they're less involved than they're uninvolved, and that's typical of an irritant versus an allergic reaction. Another example of a hand dermatitis in a different patient, but this is a very common occupational thing. And it's one that they, doesn't disable them because you can protect them uh, from it. Another example here. Atopic individuals especially have sensitive skin, and I'm more prone to this. Now this is a guy with an irritant contact dermatitis. He was working out in the farmer's field, and a crop duster came down and sprayed him. And uh, that's probably the worst irritant contact dermatitis I've seen. But uh, it doesn't have to be just on the humans. Again, atopic individuals are mostly predisposed. We treat it with corticosteroids topically and protective measures, measures for them in the future. Now, this was a florist who came in and had this itchy rash on her, it's her left hand. She, her left hand was her dominant hand. And uh, it was just there, and at times it would flare up and get a lot worse, and other times it would get better. And being a floral worker, I had to bring in a bouquet of flowers. And we did patch testing on her, not using the true test, but 
rather using these fin chambers and take a little part of the leaf, part of the petal of the flower and put it on each one of these uh, little aluminum wells on this. When we brought it back, it was the Peruvian lily that broke her out, and that's actually the most common in the floral industry. This is her patch test. These were the Peruvian lily tests. And this, this was something else over here, and it was unrelated to her hand. And this is a positive patch test. And this is a, what I call a three plus reaction. One plus is where it's fairly red, two plus is where it's red and raised a little bit. Three plus is when it's vesicular, and four plus is when you get a big blister. This is a different uh, floral worker with the same sensitivity, and it was on her right hand, because that's her dominant hand. So we told them, uh, these people, whenever there was a bouquet that needed to prove the lemon, I let somebody else make it. Stay away from these are proving proving the abilities out from areas the sign of the for. And again, it's the most common cause of floral workers. It used to be chrysanthemums. Chrysanthemums you see in floral workers and people who work at funeral homes. Uh, and it's actually in the Alstrom area to a family A allergy and avoidance of it is the key. Now this was a a patient who came in and he actually was a med student and guy who was trying to make this into dermal graphism because he recognized the linearity of it. He was also thinking about Pterosis rosy because it was kind of a Christmas tree pattern. But if you really looked at it closely, uh, this is one lesion. We call this serpiginous snake like And it's a burrow, too big for a scabies burrow. And what this guy did is he was he had built decks. And the first thing he would do is put sand down and then he uh, would build the deck, and then he would come back in time to wire it, lay down in the sand on his back, and wire the, the deck. Well, every stray cat in the neighborhood has been coming around using that sand pile as a, as a litter box, and defecating the feces containing the footwork of the, the dog that he had, and like it's like the stuff that was in And um, as he laid down, um, these burrowed into his skin, so, going back here, yeah, I mean, every dot you see there is where there's a footworm larvae curling into the skin. So he's miserable. You think he's itching? Oh, God. Um, he's, um, and here you not only want to treat the worm, most of these people have a high, very high peripheral eosinophilia, and a lot of times they're coughing because they have to get some cold pneumonia called lepharginum, and so you use prednisone to treat the, the itch and rash, along with uh, thylobendazole, so I usually use it. It's sometimes hard to find that. You can use abendazole if you can't find the, the thylobendazole. And it's called cutaneous log of migraine. It's creeping eruption. Catworms are what people call it. I've had a lot of people come and say, Doc, I've got catworms, because they know what it is. Uh, plumbers itch. Plumbers crawl into their houses and they get this, and so it's a Again, the Ancyclostoma brasiliensis, um, and self-limiting in this country, are the parts of the world that can go internally. Uh, Leffler's pneumonia, don't forget about that, and thiamidazole, but we're going to make systemic steroid. Now, this is a scrub nurse who comes in, and she's got an itchy rash on her hands, uh, and uh, we patch tested her fruitless because it's back in the days when latex free gloves were much, much more expensive. Pretty much had to prove that another scrub nurse did the same thing. And what we used on these people was the true test. And again, this is about uh, 85 bucks for one of these. And now it tests you. It used to be uh, 24 things. Now it's 29 things that people react to. And uh, they're taped on the back. And uh, here you've got a couple of reactions. This one here is a different patient. That was a uh, person that came back and had this reaction and put the template up against it was thine low salt. Now somebody with latex allergies is going to be allergic to thine ram or capto and or cardinal. And so getting them in latex gloves allows them to come back to work and treating what they have with corticosteroid. And that's a true allergy that if they couldn't get latex free gloves to be the same. That's what helps define an allergic uh, reaction that's important, that they can't get back to work. If they can't stay away from what they're exposed to, it becomes a chronic disability.
So we did a patch testing to, to prove that in, in patients uh, if it's related to their work. And again, latex free gloves are what they needed. This is a farmer who comes in and you see it's sparing his forehead way up here and wears a hat. And this is a burning sensation that's in the sun exposed areas. It spares under his chin some, and he spares his eyelids a little bit. And <laughs> he's a white person in his own uh, branding felty, roxicam. And that's a photosensitizer. This is a phototoxic eruption. Same guy here. And he's going out every day working in the sun. And again, it's bigger to work as well. He's wearing his cap and protecting his skin from his clothes. Um, now, this is going to happen if I gave everybody in this room doxycycline with all the outdoors in the sun. The people with white skin would burn real quick. And it's in the UVA range with most people, so even the sun blockers don't, the, you know, the sun protection uh, sunscreens don't work very well. A um, couple, couple of them are in the UVB range, but most are in the UVA. Yeah, if, if you have dark skin, and I gave you doxycycline, it took you normally three hours to burn. You might burn in about uh, an hour, but you'd still burn. Everybody in the room would have a phototoxic eruption throughout one night. So this is fairly common. And uh, this is another guy who used to like to sit in the front porch drinking beer with his buddies and had a shirt open in the summer. And he had a phototoxic eruption too. Again, a very common condition. And it can just be an exaggerated blistering sunburn. And be if it's chronic, it uh, look more like this. This is a photoallergic eruption, and this is where you need sunlight and cell mediated immunity. So this requires the uh, sensitization, and there are drugs that can give you this as well. And, um, and th this is much rarer. This can occur in any race, uh, and you will see the dark skin in the Photoallergic is rare. Phototoxic is very, very common. And again, most of the time, both of these are in the UVA range. This is almost always a white person who comes to the house and this is this one again the end race. Here's a guy with uh, itchy red bumps. In fact, we term this IRBD, itchy red bump disease. It's got a differential that's long, long, long. What this guy had done a few days before was carry bales of hay. And uh, what we suspected this was, and I think we're probably right, it was uh, grain itch or straw mites. And it's a mite set there in the a lot of times. And we used to, uh, when I was a kid, go up at the hayloft to run the head of the farm. And we'd get to the rope hanging from the rafters and we'd swing from the pile of the bales of hay up onto the big pile of hay. And always when I did that, a day or two later, I'd be covered with itchy red bumps. I'd be itchy the IRDD myself. And we treat that with a top of the stirrup, but it's mite bites, which you what you do, you can treat the, the straw area, you can use DEET, I have a little of my uh, spray to prevent it uh, to some extent. Um, but it, it's once it's there, you just got to use corticosteroids to put it up. IRBD, long differential, the bug bites are high up. Again, the Pyamodes species mites is what is that they normally parasitize insects, but if you're handy, they'll jump on you and bite you. Now, this was a guy who came in, he's a farmer, and uh, thought he knew what he was allergic to, and it was one of the uh, herbicides that he uses, but he brought in several of them that he had been using recently, and he delivered them down and did some patch testing using the fin chambers that I showed earlier. Now, here's the back, again, there's a little bit of called fin chambers, and it turned out he was allergic to aliquor, which is lasso herbicide, it's one of the ones he had recently been working with. And it's just a matter of staying away from that. Um, you know, let somebody else do it loading on the tractor. Um, it can be other things. It can be fungicides, biocides, antibiotics, stuff. Uh, fertilizer, you can have nickel in a lot of times. The nickel out of here for that much things. But avoidance of that, using cortical steroids to clear them up is what we did. But you need patch testing to figure out which one it is. And that's kind of time consuming. It's not really first well anymore. This lady worked at a plywood factory, and she came in and she says, I'm allergic to wood. And uh, her uh, boss had already decided we better go through testing. He sent 
little Ziploc bags full of the, all the different, and there were like six different woods that she was exposed to. And uh, so we examined her. She had it on her chest. It was totally convinced this was the wood that we used, but not more support. And uh, what we did is a KOH showed the edge of it, and this was fungus. This is all green. I think you can kind of see that when you look at these. So this is related to work in the sense that it's a human environment and she sweats a lot there. But is it disabling or anything long term? No. And uh, what I would treat her with nowadays is terbenafin, which is now you can get at Walmart, four dollars a month. I have no stock at Walmart. Um, but the uh, greasy fulvin is what we used to use, but greasy fulvin's got to be really expensive in Walmart selling it for benefit, much cheaper. Hot human environment was the only thing that was a risk factor for her. This girl knew what she had, and she came in with that complaint. And uh, she's a musician. Does she play violin? And violin has a metal piece right here. And metal that breaks you out is almost always nickel. And so uh, you can actually test metal for nickel with using the Night test or your dimethylglyoxine test, and it's DMGO plus ammonium hydroxide. And when you test a metal that has nickel in it, it turns pink. And you test my ring right here, it didn't have it. And uh, it doesn't mean it's cheap jewelry that has nickel in it because, you know, 14 karat gold has 10 karats of another metal to harden it and choose the nickel. In Europe, they've made it against the law in most countries over there not to use nickel because it's such a common sense about it. We tested her by and had a nickel in it. And uh, she could not find us. It would be like permanent encounter. She tried that and it didn't work. So it didn't play. Um, but next to poison ivy, nickel is by far the most common cutaneous allergen we see. It's in bell buckles, it's in jewelry, it's in a lot of different things. So I have the patient get a nickel test kit and test everything that they use that's metal. And avoidance is the key. This lady uh, worked in it as a cleaning lady for the hospital, and she said, I'm losing my pigment. And it was just on her hands. This looks like vitiligo. But when you see it just on the hands of somebody who's a cleaner, and say, bring in some of the cleaning solution that you use. And she brought this in, and this is a phenol containing cleanser. And phenol is a uh, deep pigment. And uh, I said, do you wear gloves? And she said, yeah, but the problem is, is that this will even penetrate your protective gloves. So we actually have her end up putting a pocketbook down the side of the protective gloves to see if we can get it worse. Um, but it's due to phenolic germicidal solutions, and especially in hospitals that. So that's a chemical repigmentation related to the occupation. This is a mailman, and he has an itchy ranch. He used to work up north, and he moved down south here. And the first thing we did, you know, so there's no toenail involved, there was not much between his toes, but we did a KOH for the blood and fungus, and that wasn't. So it's time to do patch testing. He is a mailman, walks a lot, and he was allergic to chromate, which is found in shoe leather. And, uh, so he needed to get him a new pair of shoes, and uh, this is just a different patient, but again, another shoe out. This is fairly common. Uh, in steel toed shoes, you can see it due to nickel. You can see it due to a whole variety of other things. The uh, rubber or adhesive that are used in shoes, are, or even the inserts, uh, can do rubber sometimes. You know, allergies to these compounds, leather with your company allergy, and you make them safe for shoes. So when you test it, you can use shoe parts in your pin chamber that you can use the tube. This is a commercial fisherman. He comes in with this. This is actually, you can see kind of the pearly edge of this. This is a basal cell cancer. It involves probably a much bigger area than what we're seeing here. And it involves probably the nasal lacrimal duct. And so this is one that we send to Dr. Basie, our low surgeon, and um, to make sure you get it all the first time. And uh, this is from chronic sun exposure, obviously. This is a very seeing these even down in the teenage years now. Um, 
counsel him regarding slip, slop, slap, ram, slip on the long sleeve shirt, slop on some sunscreen, slap on the white rib pad, and wrap your face with sunglasses. Uh, this is the best for outdoor workers in general. And again, all skin uh, cancer types and skin aging are risk factors for working in the This is a commercial fisherman who came in with Dr. I got fish port. And this is really erysipeloid to erysipeloid for exercise pathway. And even though this is a self-limited infection and most people are not very sick, they usually don't have fever of region myopathy, it should be treated because it rarely can get to the bloodstream because of the cardiac and death. Uh, the one main difference uh, from erysipelous is it's vancomycin resistant to the other sick patient. Um, otherwise, penicillin, erythromycin, caplex, any of it's also found in the occupation of the poultry industry or swine, causes causes swine near syphilis, so it's also found in, uh, in uh, pig farms. This guy comes in and said he's a farm worker, and he said they were working in one of the outbuildings on the farm, and he got bit by a brown the flute, so he's in your office right now. He says, uh, my friend actually um, caught the spider and it's over there in that little, that little box. And he said, you see, it's got the fiddle on the back. And of course, the other name for a brown recluse is fiddleback spider. Uh, this is way too big a spider for a brown recluse. And actually, we don't have a brown recluse spider in our area in North Carolina. So this is a wolf spider, and this will give you a spider bite if there's not anything serious like a brown recluse. Um, and you, you need to know that. This is a brown blue spider, and it's about the size of a quarter. It's a little tiny spider. It does have a few on its back, you can see here. Um, and it gives you an ulcerative kind of a big ulcer a lot of times. But this is the distribution of it. You can see it's not found anywhere pretty much in North Carolina except the very tip next to Tennessee. And um, I have never seen a brown blue spider. I've seen hundreds of cases of what we call by the primary care doctor. Brown uh, first bite has been written from high dermic inverticulation to a large vessel of vasculitis. So there's a big differential for sorts that you can't explain. And a lot of doctors say, I'm going to need a spider. A lot of times patients come in and say, I think I was bitten by a spider. But most of the, around here, it's not. <laughs> the one dangerous spider we have right here is the black widow. It has very little red markings on the back. And on the ventral surface, it's got the uh, hourglass, the red hourglass. And this gives you almost nothing to bite sight. In fact, some people don't even feel the bite. And you get the central tetany, usually starting in the abdominal area, that spreads. And you can treat this in most cases with the muscle relaxant. Uh, there is an hand bend available for black widow spider, but it's almost never needed except when you don't hit it. Don't tell really people that are really dangerous. Um, don't forget your tetanus prophylaxis for spider mite. Most of our spider mites here are the wolf spider, the aragonope, which is the golden uh, spider that you see in the garden with the zigzag on its web. Chiracanthi, which is a little yellow spider that's up in the porch light on the front porch. Uh, jumping spider, which is a little tiny black spider, orb weaver spider, and the fishing spider, which is common around here. And again, they're not serious bites. And that's all I've got. That's just kind of how to approach different occupational skin problems. Anybody have any questions?